Welcome. Welcome. All right, there we go. All right, we're in the same place. I don't have my glasses on, and so you are very blurry right now, but that's okay. I know you're out there. And I want to welcome those who are online and viewing. It is uh, great to have you with us as well. We get to start off this morning with uh, an individual who has made a decision to follow Christ and knows the importance of not having a faith that is just private and quiet and kept to oneself. But one of the beauties of our faith is that we can share it openly with individuals unashamedly. And so I'd like to introduce you to Shannon Blair. She's going to come in, and she's going to share her story with you. Shannon, come on. The mic is yours. Awesome. I'm really nervous, so, (laughs) but here I go. Alrighty. So, hello, everyone. My name is Shannon Blair, and I'm a new attender of this church. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for having me and being so welcoming. Secondly, Pastor Matt Wiley, I would like to thank you for arranging this special day and giving me your encouragement to share my testimony with others, although speaking in front of others is terrifying for me. Thirdly, I would like to thank my fiance, family and friends who have come to support me today through my walk with God. Now, I would like to share my testimony in hopes that it could potentially help others. In March, 2021, I began my journey in developing my relationship with God. So, you may be wondering, what led me here? Growing up, my mother was always religious, and I would attend this church with her and my brothers. But I never took it very seriously as I was young, and I didn't think that it was cool to go to church or talk about God. As I got older, I strayed away from God and began to become drawn toward the New Age spirituality, where I was meditating, going to psychics, buying crystals, and using angel cards. They were angel cards, right? So I thought what I was doing was okay. The New Age practices that I was indulging in brought me temporary answers that I thought that I needed, but it was never enough. It was a temporary fix, and I was always chasing my purpose in life, but I never had a definite answer. So one day, I was holding one of my angel card decks created by a popular New Age author, Doreen Virtue. For some reason, I had a thought coming into my head that directed me to take a look at her Instagram page to see if she had any new books or card decks available. So, I looked her up on Instagram to find that this new age, oh, I looked her up on Instagram to find that this new age author had completely turned her life over to Christianity. She had burned all of her books and card decks and was encouraging her fans to do the same. She expressed how deceived she was and admitted that the life that she was living was demonic and an abomination to God. I instantly felt guilt with a sickness in my stomach, causing me to begin crying, repenting, and praying to the Lord. I knew immediately in my gut and my soul that what I was doing was very wrong. After an emotional evening of repentance, I went to bed. The next day, I was sitting in my home office, and I looked out the window to see one dove land on my deck railing, and then another flew and sat right beside it. I had never seen doves in my backyard before, and I knew immediately that it was God. I felt at peace and knew that the day prior, I was being led by the Holy Spirit. Since then, I began writing, uh, reading my Bible every day and attending church online and now in person, and I've never turned back. 
My life before revolved around finding the answers when he has been the only answer all along. My life has transformed to what is my plan, to what is his plan for me. Today I want to commit my life fully to you, God. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness, love, and grace. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross so that my past sins could be forgiven. And thank you to the Holy Spirit for leading me in the right direction. Please show me how I can serve you today, tomorrow, and every day going forward. My life is yours. And just to clear things up, it is beyond cool to go to church and talk about God. Amen. There's a couple of verses that I'd like to share with you. Ones that I believe are life verses that are worth taking with you and even memorizing if you can do that. Found in Proverbs 3, it's two verses together, verses 5 and 6. It says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. All right. Shannon, based on your testimony you've shared, but also what I've seen you live out in your life, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Good morning, everybody. It's great to come into God's house and also to witness what the church is all about. People coming to faith, being transferred out of darkness and into light. So we are very excited about that, and we want to continue in that work as well. I have a couple of announcements just to move things forward. And just as you saw on the screen, that Elisha House launched their baby bottle campaign, Clarity, as they're now known known as, and so the bottle, baby bottles are in the lobby that you can pick up, and you can fill it with your loose change, and you bring it back on Father's Day, June 19th, and it will be sent over that part of their campaign to raise funds for their work. The other announcement is that on July 10th, mark your calendars, we will be having the WOW event, that's Worship on the Water. It's been a while since we've done that, but it's an opportunity for the churches to come together but on the canal to worship and to proclaim the gospel to those who might be in the area. So July 10th is for that event, so keep that on your calendars, and there will be more information as we go along. Those are the announcements that I have been asked to bring to your attention, and so we'll have our, our opening prayer, but I want to set the stage with Second Chronicles 7, verses 1 to 3. This is the passage that when Solomon had built the temple, after the temple was built, he prayed. And this is what it said, When Solomon finished praying, fire descended from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests were not able to enter the Lord's temple because the glory of the Lord filled the temple. All the Israelites were watching when the fire descended and the glory of the Lord came down on the temple. They bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. They worship and praise the Lord, for he is good and his faithful love endures forever. Let us join together. This is Pentecost Sunday in which we see another event where God's fire, God's glory, filled the temple, his people, and sent them out to proclaim the gospel. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we give thanks to you that every one of here who is a believer in Jesus Christ has become a part of your kingdom, and as we come together, we are living stones. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would come upon us and fill this place, and we would offer up ourselves as living sacrifices for the renewing of our hearts and minds so that we no longer live for self, but live for Jesus. We surrender this time to you. We draw near to you that you might cleanse us and purify us, empower us, and send us out just like Jesus, you said to the disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait until you have received the power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We humble ourselves to you, almighty God, thanking you for our salvation in Jesus Christ, thanking you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross for us, and thanking you, Holy Spirit, for revealing to us the truth and setting us free. We come near to you with our hearts and worship and praise. Come upon us, teach us, transform us, we pray. In Jesus' most awesome name we pray. Amen. I'd invite Stephen to come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Good morning, everyone. I encourage you to open up your Bibles to Acts 2. It's a long and an amazing chapter. So I'll give you a moment to find it, Acts chapter 2, and we could go through it together. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound, that of a violent rushing wind, came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues, like flames of fire that were divided, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them the ability for speech. 
There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one of them heard speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each one of us can hear in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking the magnificent acts of God in our own languages. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this be? But some sneered and said, they're full of new wine. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Men of Judah and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days. And they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before a great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not leave me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing this in advance, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not left in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promise of Holy Spirit. He has poured out what you both see and hear, for it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. 
And with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed their proceeds to all and anyone had an, as anyone had a need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with, with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Please stand with us.
leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born. Well, good morning, everyone. Once again, I want to introduce to you Buxar Bob. 
Buxar Bob. He's an old lumberjack from way back. And this was the saw that he used, and he was very good at it. But as he got older, he found it more and more difficult to use this kind of saw. And one day he was in town, and he was at the general store, and he was complaining about his aches and pains and how difficult it was to cut wood. He's trying to get his winter wood in for the season. And the owner of the general store said, well, Buck saw Bob, what you need is one of these. And he brought them over to this big display of chainsaws. He said, this will make your life so much easier. You'll be able to cut cords of wood in minutes. He said, really? This is what I need. So he bought one. And he went home all excited because he was going to cut some wood and he wasn't going to be in pain. And so he, he went home and used the saw. The next day, he showed up at the general store again. And the owner came over and said, Buck saw, Bob, what are you doing? Why do you have that chainsaw with you? He said, I used this all day yesterday, hours. And I was only able to cut one piece of wood. He said, I don't know why you sold it to me. This thing's useless. He said, oh, really? Let me check it out. He goes over, turns the switch. And Buck saw, Bob jumped back. What was that? Buck saw Bob had a saw, but he had no power. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We don't want to be like Buck saw Bob. We want to be like the disciples of Jesus, right? Amen. Amen. So today is Pentecost Sunday. And I hope at the end of the day that we will realize that Pentecost Sunday is not something relegated to the past, but it's something relevant to us today. And so before we go down that path, we need to look at the question, what is Pentecost? Pentecost, first, Pente, refers to a period of 50 days after Passover. It was a festival that they would celebrate the harvest, number three. And so they would celebrate the harvesting of the wheat and the grains. And just keep in mind, remember what Jesus said in Matthew the harvest is ready. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out labor to bring in the harvest. That, that's behind that scene. But they were also anticipating that on this day of this festival, there would be a repeat of what happened in the days of King Solomon, that when he built the temple and he prayed for the temple and for God to fill that temple with his glory and his power, it happened. We read that this morning in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. They were anticipating that that was going to happen again. And so every year they would celebrate Pentecost by the celebrating of the harvest of the gathering of the grain, which would represent the gathering of the nations. Because remember Jesus said, my house be called a house of prayer for the nations, and the presence of God would come. That's what they were anticipating. That's what they were expecting. That's what they were waiting for. That's what Pentecost was about prior to the disciples experiencing Pentecost. So our account that, we, that Stefan read, and thank you for reading that, Stefan. Our account brings all of these three components together into one event. Fifty days after the Passover, the resurrection of Jesus, the glory of God fell on 120 disciples. The 120 disciples were actually meeting in the temple. We often say they were meeting in the upper room, and we assumed it was an upper room in one of the homes with the flat roof. But none of the homes of that time were big enough to accommodate 120, but there were several rooms in the upper areas of the temple that could. So here are the 120 representing the Levitical priesthood who were praying in rotation 24-7, here's the new Levitical priesthood, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, and Jesus is the high priest. They're meeting, and the glory of God falls on the new temple, the people. That's what happened. And what happened? They were anticipating a harvest. What was the harvest? 3,000 souls came into the kingdom that day, and every day after that, people were being added to the kingdom. That was Pentecost, coming together in Acts 2. 
Pentecost is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the body of Christ to empower believers to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that an exciting thing? Are we not excited? Amen. Amen. It is exciting, but there's a problem. What's the problem? The institution called church is building without power. The church has become like Baksar Bob. We got the stuff, but we don't have the power. How do I know that? Well, let's look at our history of the Methodist tradition. In the days of John Wesley, when the power of God came upon Wesley and others and revival swept through the English countryside, hundreds of thousands of people came to the knowledge of Jesus. There was power. All of these components that we're going to read about today were there back then in the 18th century. The church today, Free Methodist Church in Canada, in, 20, in the year 2000, we had maybe 12,000 members. Currently, we have 55. Where's the power? We have an institution, but we're not functioning like a kingdom. And that's what we need today. The institution called church is building without power. And we'll talk about more of those issues next week. But here, something needs to change. We need to start doing things differently, or rather, we need to let him start doing what he wants to do in order to see his church, his kingdom, manifest itself in our culture, in our city, here with us. And what is that thing that needs to change? The church needs to reset itself. It needs to reset itself. It needs to get back. How many of you have ever had to push the reset button on your computer? Some of us weekly, right? Why isn't this stupid thing not working? Push the reset button. We need to reset or let the church be reset on the power of God. But we don't always understand what that means or what that looks like. There are five works of power by the Holy Spirit. And they're all in this text. That's why we had the whole text read so we can understand the diverse expression or evidence of power of the Holy Spirit. The first one is called prevenient power. Now, if you're steeped in Methodist language, that's part of our theology. We believe what's called prevenient grace. Grace is another word for power. We believe in prevenient power. And all it means is that the Holy Spirit is at work in all things. Remember, it says in Joel, that Stefan read this morning, that as they thought that they were drunk on new wine, Peter said, people, they're not drunk, but it is as what the prophet Joel has said, that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. The Holy Spirit was doing something. He would pour it out upon all flesh. We see that, but also we, they began to hear something, didn't they? Did you hear that in the text? They all heard a wind sweeping through the city. The word prevenient means preparatory or anticipatory. He is preparing the stage. He is setting things in motion so that people will come to the knowledge of Jesus. I didn't wake up one day and decided I was going to get saved. But there were people praying, people witnessing. And who was moving them? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prepares the soil. He prepares the ground. He sets the stage. And at the right moment, the Holy Spirit revealed. That's how you came into the kingdom of God. Through the power of the Spirit. And that's what's happening here. When the Holy Spirit poured upon all flesh, they all heard something happening in the city. And they rushed to the temple. And they heard the wind. And they heard the speaking in tongues. That's the Holy Spirit setting the stage. That's the first work we need to remember. So when you're thinking about your neighbors, remember the Holy Spirit trying to do something in their lives as well. And when you think about your neighbors, Lord, how should I pray for them, Holy Spirit? He will tell you how to pray for them that set them on the path to coming to the knowledge of Jesus. That's what we call prevenient power. 
the Holy Spirit was doing that in this text, and we need to function with that understanding as well. Secondly, the second work of the Holy Spirit, the second power, is regenerating power. This is that power that enabled the people to believe in the gospel, right? They were born again. Those disciples that said, or not disciples, but the people in the crowd that said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter responds with, repent and believe the gospel and you'll receive the Spirit. But it's, what must we do to be saved? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit creates that environment, that culture, that desire, that hunger. And then the Holy Spirit opens up one's mind to the reality of Jesus. And he gives us the power to become born again. That's what Jesus said, right, in John 3. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. How do we get born again? By receiving and believing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And thereby we have been given the power to be the children of God. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit does it. Remember Nicodemus? He said, how can that happen? How can I be born again? Jesus said, the Holy Spirit. You can't see the Holy Spirit, but he moves through the trees like the wind, and when the leaves begin to move, something's going to happen. The Holy Spirit set the stage to enable people to be regenerated or born again. And he's doing that in the book of Acts. And in that moment, 3,000 people became followers of Jesus and were baptized into the kingdom of God. That's the second work. First work is prevenient, enabling, setting the stage. That's how I understand prevenient. The Holy Spirit set the stage for you to hear the truth and enables you to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. You with me so far? The third power is the empowering power. And here we think about Peter. Peter. Remember Peter, the night that Jesus was arrested? What did he do? He hid. He ran away. He denied Jesus. But here now the whole city is looking at him. And it says in the text that, G, that Peter stood up. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them. Those are not just words, those are very specific words. The Spirit of God came upon him to speak with authority and with power, and he preached a message with authority and power. And that's what we need in the church today. There was conviction and there was opportunity. Peter responded to the move of the Spirit within him. We need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul talks about, you know, one time I went to the city of Athens, Paul says, and I tried to debate with the philosophers of the day, and I didn't win very many converts, it says. Only a few believed. And as he left Athens, he says, as I went to Corinth, I determined that I was no longer going to try to argue with philosophical words or words of persuasion, but with power, with signs and wonders. It's the signs and wonders and the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit that's going to grab people's attention. We can argue philosophy all day long. I can vouch for that because I studied philosophy, and all it is is one argument against another, all using a different set of principles and premises, but it has no power. It's the power of God releasing the gift to preach the message of Jesus and enable people to believe. That's what we need in the church today. It's not theology or philosophy. It's the power of God. And so here's Peter, who once denied Jesus, now speaking with power and authority that led to regeneration of souls for the kingdom of God. Can you see how this is working? And then fourthly, the fourth power, sanctifying power. We all know the word sanctifying means to be set apart. It's that inner work of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Things like joy and peace and all of those things. That's in the text. It translated differently in this particular translation. But it says, they gathered with joy and sincere hearts. That's the work of the Spirit. When the Spirit begins to move in us and we realize we need Jesus. And we accept Jesus. He changes us. 
Have you experienced that change? Isn't it joyful? Isn't it peaceful? Isn't it loving? It's the power of God. That's what does that. If we're going to rely on human emotions, it will be short-lived. But the emotions and the presence of the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit will put something new and fresh in us like we've never experienced. How many times have we gone into a church and there's no celebration, there's no joy, they look like dead people? Right? I think Jesus said something about that. You people like whitewashed tombs. Right? We can get that in the church today too. If you're an institutional church, you're going to go down that path. Your tradition becomes more important than Jesus himself. And so the sanctifying power is in the early church as well. They were excited with what the Holy Spirit was doing inside of them. But we're not done yet. There's one more. Koinonia power. Koinonia is fellowship. Now, I'm not talking about fellowship of having a cup of coffee and a cookie after church. Right? <laughs> Which is a good thing to do, by the way. I'm not against that. <laughs> but Holy Spirit koinonia, koinonia power, is, notice that it said several times in the latter part of that chapter, they were devoted to each other. Devoted to each other. Because now you're the body of Christ. They wanted to spend time together before they went off to work because they work from sun up to sundown. Before they went to work every day they met together for prayer and celebration and to hear the teachings of the gospels and to be surrendered to Jesus so that they can tell others about Jesus. That's koinonia power. Are we seeing that today? Sometimes, oh, I'm just too busy. But when the Spirit of God begins to move, you want to be there. You want to get up before the morning starts, and you want to spend time with Jesus and with others. Before you go to bed, you want to spend time with Jesus. The Spirit of God changes us on the inside, changes our culture, changes our atmosphere, and we want to be with other Christians. That's what happened in the Wesleyan revival and every revival. They wanted to be together. Because the Spirit of God knits us together as the body of Christ. And that's what this is, the church is supposed to be about. These are the five power components that the church need to be reset on. And if no, I just want to bring this to clarity. This is not something new in the New Testament. It was hinted at throughout the Old Testament. We know the Holy Spirit would work on three types of individuals in the Old Testament. The prophets, the priests, and the kings. And one day God said to Moses, Moses, bring your elders up to the mountain. And so he brought up 70. And the Spirit of God fell upon the 70, and they all began to prophesy. And they became his assistants and workers for what God wanted to do in the camp. But Joshua came running up to Moses. Moses, there's two guys in the camp. They are prophesying. They're not part of the 70. They're the two other guys. Should I go and tell them to stop? And Moses said, no. He said, I wish or I would that all would prophesy. That itself was a prophecy. Because when, the, when Joel prophesied that the Spirit of God would put out of all, all flesh, they were all prophesy and dream dreams and have visions. Jesus comes along, and what is Jesus? He's the prophet and the priest and the king all rolled into one, and he was anointed by the Holy Spirit to exercise power and authority over all things. And now that we're in Christ Jesus, we become an extension of that very same work to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, you will do greater things than I have done. You remember that? But he's not talking about more sensational. Because you can't get more sensational than raising Lazarus from the dead. Right? But greater has to do with numbers. Jesus was one person in time and space. But now he had 120 in the upper room. 
120 times more, and they would multiply and multiply and keep expanding and growing until the Roman Empire itself would come under the lordship of Jesus and everybody would declare it a Christian. Now that was a mistake, but nevertheless, that enemy were turned upside down for the gospel because they relied on the power of God. And that's what we need today. We need the power. The Holy Spirit is the engine that drives the church. Anybody ever drive a car where only one of the cylinders wasn't firing properly? Sounds great, eh? Yeah. And when that happens and you're not firing on all cylinders, you lose all your power. You're not firing with all the power that should be behind you. I knew somebody back home in New Brunswick, they wouldn't get their car fixed and they had one cylinder. They were powerless. And that's what happened to us. If one of these components is missing, we're not firing on all cylinders. And what that means is we have to have a mindset that the Holy Spirit is constantly at work, touching people's lives, drawing them closer and closer to Jesus so that at the right moment they might experience the work of the Spirit in being born again, being set apart and sanctified and being drawn into a fellowship that spirit filled and there's such joy that you cannot stand being apart from this group. That is the power of the Holy Spirit at work. And that's what God wants to see in his people. If we don't have that, we will simply become a religious institution with no power. We can have great creeds, we can have great doctrine, we can have great teaching, but if there is no anointing, no presence or power of the Holy Spirit, it's still dead. Hey, that sounds like the Pharisees, right? They had it all, but they had nothing. And so just because we have a building, and I'm not talking about us, just because we might have a building, we might have some people, and we might sing some songs, but if the power of God is not here, we're just another holy club, another religious club. No different than social clubs in our culture. So it's time to reset the church on the work and person and power of the Holy Spirit. There's a key verse that we need to remind ourselves of. Verse 39. So when he's, Peter says to the, the people who said, what must we do now? He said, repent and believe the gospel and you'll receive the Holy Spirit because this gift is for you and for you and for all those who are called from afar. Now what that's referencing is the fact that every generation needs an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost was not a one-time event that was to cover the day of Pentecost until the time of Jesus. It is to be every generation experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and experiencing all of these things like we read in Acts. Acts is what is normative in the church or it should be. And if it's not... We need to be asking ourselves the question, why not? And that was a question I asked years ago. In 1992, I finished seminary, and I was in my prayer room, and I had my Bible. Some of you have heard this before, but I held my Bible up to the ceiling, and I gave it a good smack, and I said, God, do you see this? I just finished reading that chapter. Do you see this, God? Why isn't this happening today? And the Lord said, wait. That's the first time I heard him. Wait. Then he began to speak to me and say, you need to search it out and study it and seek me. Seek me. Right? Jeremiah 29, 11. We love that verse, don't we? For I have a purpose and plan for your life, a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. And then we put a period at the end of that sentence, Right? It's not a period, it's a comma. If, if, next verse, if you seek me with all your heart, I will apprehend you. 
You want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and in the fellowship? We've got to seek him. We've got to ask and keep asking and seeking and seeking and knocking until he comes with his power. Because it's only then that we're going to become the kind of church that God has set us apart to be. We can't settle for our traditions. If the tradition is not rooted in power, it's powerless and the tradition is useless. But we'll talk more about that next week. We need to reset the church back on the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can ask, every one of us as generation to generation can ask. Are we excited yet? Well, we don't sound like it. (laughs) Are you excited about the possibility that we could be living like Acts again? That's what we want. I sure hope that's what I've been praying for 30-some years. Praying and waiting, praying and waiting, waiting and praying. But we need this if we're going to reach this generation with the gospel of Jesus. The time to reset the church by having another Pentecost. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's get excited for that. Let the Holy Spirit begin to percolate what he desires to do in us that we might reach Welland and Niagara and Canada with the good news of Jesus. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you have a purpose for us, a purpose that is at the cross where our sins are taken care of, a purpose where you would pour out your spirit upon us and within us to enable us to be born again, empower us, and to set us apart that we might proclaim Jesus to this world. Father, I pray for every one of us that in our own hearts we will begin to seek after the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Because, Lord, we're not a religious institution. We are the body of Christ. And we need you, Holy Spirit, to be moving through us in our fellowship that there's joy and peace and just excitement and enthusiasm for the things of God. And so if you are interested or wanting the Holy Spirit to be released into you, there are those who will say that, Father, that we have the Holy Spirit already, and that's true. But Jesus also said, come to me who are thirsty, and rivers of life will flow from you, referring to the Holy Spirit. We know we have received the Spirit, but we're asking for the releasing of the Holy Spirit like a mighty river from within. If that's you, just say, Lord, that's what I want. That's what I want. That I can become an effective witness to this world about Jesus Christ. In his name, I pray and we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bernie. One of the things that we've been talking about for the last year plus is how we are called to not just be a regular institutionalized church that we're not going to look sideways and go what are they doing oh that looks good we should do that too we believe that we need to be individuals who listen to what god wants to do and then be obedient to what that is and play it out in the way that he wants it to play out in our lives And so in saying that, we're going to do something that is very different, that from what I understand in talking to all the pastors in the city, they are not doing. We're not doing it to be different. We're doing it because we've been commissioned to do so. And that commissioning is to become uh, homes of prayer everywhere. And so what we're going to do is today we're going to launch, for those who uh, would like to participate in this, is uh, the homes of prayer. Uh, We have put together these little... Uh, pamphlets you can put in people's mailboxes in your community. Don't go far, don't go wide, stay close to home. There's 20 of them, all right? So strategically place them around you. Hopefully they're homes you're already praying for. We have a sticker that you can put in your window. If you're old enough to remember block, uh, block, what are they called? Block parent. Block parents, right? All right, and the kid's bullying you, run to that home that's got a block parent home, you'd be safe. This is one of those, this is that. I know you're looking at it like, that's weird. Um, this is the size of the decal that'll be on your front window, all right? And so people can identify your home by seeing one of these in the window. And so what we are telling individuals is that we will pray for you. It's that simple. 
If somebody in your neighborhood and those people who have one of these you dropped off and you say, hey, listen, if you want some, us to pray for you, you can drop a prayer request in our mailbox. We'll pray for you. If you would like to have somebody pray with you on your doorstep or on our doorstep, then we'll pray for you. We're not encouraging people to invite people in. You have no idea who they are just yet. That could be unsafe. But what we do want to do is we want to reach into our communities and be a blessing to individuals to pray with them and to reach into the world as best as we can. So that's today. You'll be able to get one of these, and a package of these and that decal out there at the welcome booth should you want to be a part of this. Uh, in talking about our plans for launching this, we want you to know that we're only going to give these to individuals who are currently a part of the membership of Rice Road Community Church. Reason being is we want to make sure that there's accountability. And I'm sure you can appreciate that, that if somebody is doing it, we don't want somebody going rogue or doing something that uh, wouldn't be a good representative of not just this church, but also the community as well. And so this should be one of those things where you can ask yourself, you know, well, what does it mean to be a member? And, you know, wh why would I do that? Well, we'd love to talk to you about that. But we're only going to be extending this right now to those who are part of the membership to be able to do that and to reach into our community. Okay? So, in that, we want to reach as many people as we possibly can with what it exactly it is that Pastor Bernie has shared. Now, we're going to be doing communion together. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul, talking to the Corinthians, wanted to share with them what it is that Jesus, Jesus did with the original disciples, but also what he is commissioning us to continue to do. And so as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, oftentimes when we take a look at this passage, we stop there, we take the bread, we take the drink, we pray and that's it. But there's more that he shared with the Corinthians that I believe we have to continue to look at and remind ourselves of. As this passage goes on, it says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If you are properly judging yourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that he may not be, we may not be condemned with the world. Why do I share that? Because we want to do things right. To do things right, we need to do things the way we've been commissioned to do them. And so what he's saying in this passage is, as you've done, if you have done what Pastor Bernie was talking about this morning, by availing yourself to God, by making a decision to follow Christ with your life, by allowing the Holy Spirit into your life, then this act that we're going to do together is for you. If you have yet to make that decision, then my encouragement to you is to do what it says in this passage. Take the time to examine your life in such a way that you just say, God, where am I at between you and where are we at? I'd like to follow you if that's what your desire is. Would you come into my life? And with that simple prayer, you will answer it and say yes. But should you not desire that, you're not there yet, then my encouragement to you is to do as this passage says, is to not do this in an unworthy way and just don't. And that's okay. So with what it is that we have here, you peel back that top layer. And that's representative of the blood, I'm sorry, of the body of Christ. 
which he allowed to be broken for us. Let's take a bit together. Similarly, the juices beneath it And although it's just grape juice, it is representative of what Christ did for us by dying on the cross for our sins and granting us access to him, to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit. Let's take it together and thanks for what he has done for us. Heavenly Father, to many this small act may seem like foolishness. But we understand that there are directives that you've given to us in the word of God that we want to be obedient to. And this is one of them. So as we have done this, Father, we do so fully wanting to say thanks to you for what it is that you've done for us. We can't ever possibly imagine the fullness of all that you endured on our behalf but we definitely give thanks to you for it. Father, we want to live our lives in such a way that it is pleasing to you. Use us, we ask, to be the people that you want us to be, the people that you need us to be, so that we may be great examples of who you are in the community around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us. Jesus 
exactly what we believe we're called to do in our communities and in our homes is to speak Jesus. And so as we provide an opportunity for people to be have a holy encounter with God through these homes of prayer, I'm really excited about this. I know it's a little bit fear and trepidation. That's okay. It's all right. We're going to grow into this thing, but I think this is one of those kind of things where God is going to be glorified and honored where people are going to have holy experiences with God like they've never had before. I have only one person in all of my life that I've ever asked, can I pray for you, say no. And I ask a lot of people. It's not just not threatening. It's actually surprising when people say, can I pray for you? Of course. I can use as much prayer as I can possibly get. We all do. So if you believe that God's calling you to be one of those homes, we would love to have as many out there as possible to care for the community that God has planted us in. As Pastor Bernie said, we're not about being a holy huddle here. This is the training grounds for doing what God's commissioned us to do out there. So let's be that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we can do nothing without you. Because in our own strength, in our own knowledge base, Father, it's empty and void without the power of your Holy Spirit. We want to be led by you, guided by you. And Father, as you've commissioned us to go and to speak the name of Jesus freely and publicly, as Shannon did this morning, we thank you for that public proclamation of faith. Father, our faith is not meant to be private. It's meant to be for all people everywhere. So is your free gift of salvation. So Father, may we avail ourselves to people. May we seek to minister to them as many people as we possibly can, even in the simple way of just praying for them and possibly even with them. 
Help us, Father, with this new venture that you're leading us into. May you be glorified through it. In Jesus' name.